you very much. Welcome to our lecture. Thank you for joining us. Today is Tuesday, September 27, 2022. I'm Steve Shields, president of Royal Asiatic Society Korea. Uh, first, I want to take this opportunity to express our sincere gratitude to our generous patron, the Asia Development Foundation, uh, who continues to support the work we're trying to do. We also appreciate our many other donors, big or small. Uh, everything is welcome and greatly needed. Uh, second, I, I would like to suggest to you that uh, you sign up for our email list. Uh, Joanne at the table in the back can help you know how to do that easily. Uh, we do not flood you with emails. We send one a week and list next week's events. So on a Thursday, we'll send an email for the next week's events. Um, we also post regularly on our Facebook page uh, and we have two or three. We have a, a business and culture club page and a literature club page that are all linked. Uh, and we have our website and we also post on uh, Meetup. Uh, and lectures are always held on the second and fourth Tuesdays of the month. So just put it on your calendar. Don't say, oh, I didn't know there was a lecture, because you can set your clock by our lecture schedule. Uh, except for the last Tuesday in December, we're all doing Christmas stuff. Uh, so do your recurring events and don't miss out. You are cordially reminded that lecture content does not necessarily reflect the opinions or positions of the Royal Asiatic Society Korea. We're joined tonight by Professor Kim Mi Gyang from Pugyang University in, in Busan. And uh, her lecture title tonight is In the Shadows of Global K Culture, Korea's Sex Industry. There's a grave reality of the sex industry in Korea, even in the modern times. When I came here almost 50 years ago, it was big, but it still is there. And uh, uh, Korea has been recognized as a front runner in human rights advocacy in East Asia, yet we still have these trafficking issues that need to be dealt with. And Professor Kim is a specialist in this topic. She's done a lot of research uh, and study and interviews uh, with people who are engaged and involved in this. Uh, Professor Kim was a tenured faculty member at Hiroshima City University in Japan uh, for several years, uh, 2005 to 2017, a long run. Uh, she has studied and written and, and talked about peace, memory, and human rights. Um, served as president of the Association of Korean Political Studies, chair of the IPSA Human Rights Research Committee, uh, was a two-term member of the ROK Presidential Council on Peaceful Unification, vice president of ROK Fulbright, alumni association. Uh, uh, her book, uh, The Rutledge Handbook of Memory and Reconciliation in East Asia, done in 2015, got the Book of the Year Award from the ROK Ministry of Education. She is a series editor uh, of the Palgrave Macmillan Studies on Human Rights in Asia, very significant series of books. Uh, as always, after the lecture, we'll have time for questions and answers. So for now, let's welcome Professor Kim. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much for having me. Um, I wanted to uh, meet you in person and share my findings about Korea's sex industry uh, with the member of with the members of Royal Asiatic Society today but it was simply not possible because of the logistics you know I teach on Tuesdays and Thursdays as well as Mondays so I just couldn't I just couldn't travel to Seoul um, and and I find that unfortunate. And I really would like to meet the members of Royal Asiatic Society in person someday when we can synchronize our schedule. 
um, before I jump into today's topic, um, you know, as Reverend Shields has, has mentioned, this topic can be quite difficult um, for the researchers in the field and as well as the students of the topic. I mean, you know, um, human trafficking and um, sex work and the structure which sustains the, 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 the business. Um, when we think when we think about all these all these details, you know, we get we get heartbroken. Um, so the topic is not easy um, to talk about. And another thing which gave me a rather complicated feelings before I decided to give a talk was that you know in this day and age where everybody it seems like everybody's talking about k-pop and k-culture and you know bts and all the all the impressive awards that korean entertainment industry um is getting you know um as as a as a as, as a korean um i am really happy and excited to see all these fantastic um receptions of Korean culture um, and, and K-pop. But at the same time, you know, um, as a sociologist, I get to see um, the dark side in the society where the underprivileged, the, the, the powerless, um, the weak are experiencing behind the glamour of K-pop and K-culture. So, I, I had actually a set of complicated feelings um, before um, deciding to give out a talk on this topic. And um, before I begin share, um, sharing screen with the audience, um, I'd like to just share um, what I got to hear um, yesterday that was, you know, I, I live in the city of Busan and I wanted to have like late dinner. I was I was running behind because I had so many things to do and um, I decided to grab something, something comforting. So I I went out for late dinner and there is a there is a nice um, chicken and beer um, restaurant in the neighborhood and I sat at a table for two, and I saw um, a group of four men um, who, who seemed like in their late 40s, um, talking about themselves. And most of the times they were talking about their children, their wives, their businesses, and and just you know, casual conversation, you know, they 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 were engaged in. And you know when you are seated right next to a group of people, and when you are eating alone, you, know, you get to hear them. I mean, you know, it's not necessarily that you know you're interested in overhearing what they are saying. You just get to hear what what you just get to hear them. And um, half an hour, about half an hour passed, and the co casual conversations continued, and it seemed like they were about to wrap it up, and then. One of the four men said, um, do you want to go to massage parlor? And another guy responded, oh, you mean the, 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 the same place? Um, and the guy who proposed the idea said, oh, do you want to go to the second floor or the fourth floor? And one of them said, of course, the fourth floor. What are you talking about? You know, why do we go to the, the second floor for, for massage? We want to go the fourth floor because there are undies working there, you know? So, you know, what a silly question. And when I was listening to their conversation, I just knew that they were, they were going for, this is great expression, quasi, quasi sexual experience after enjoying um, beer and chicken among themselves. And the way they acted came across as if they had been doing this for so many times. It was so natural. And after having a good meal, 
you know, you just go to one of those massage parlors to, to enjoy yourself with women who are not your wives. So, um, you know, I, I, as I knew that, you know, I, I was going, going to give a talk uh, on this particular topic today, I was like, oh my God, you know, huh? this kind of thing is just so common and just so natural among the men in the society. I and I, I, I get to hear them, you the know. Light, the light isn't very good here. Um, I get to I get to hear their discussions about you know which floor to go to. So um, it was a it was a a, a very strange encounter um, with a group of Korean men you know at 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 a at a at a dinner place that I that I like very much in the neighborhood, and I just got reminded over and over again that you know how how common how common that kind of behavior is in this society which i find quite saddening um and i like to share what i have prepared for the for the audience tonight um you know in addition to <laughs> In addition to uh, the conversation that I I I I happened to overhear um, late last night, late last, uh, late evening yesterday, I also um, took some photos about what I get to see in my neighborhood. Um, name cards scattered on the street, um, advertising uh, different uh, all sorts of massage services, and. Uh, when you you can call you can call the the service provider to your place a private place so that you can enjoy the kind of service that 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 that, that you desire and massage parlors in in in, in the back streets and um, something that is relatively new to my observation is the increasing frequency of um, increasing numbers of um, uh, business establishments that offer um, particular and special services for the female customers. And this happens to be one of them in which I spotted in the neighborhood, uh, ladies only. And the photo on the right hand side, the extreme right hand side says, you know, 40 jocks are waiting to serve you. So I get to see interesting gender dynamics um, in, in, in the industry. And um, where, where are these activities are taking place? There are various venues. And I categorize them uh, in terms of um, service values. And this is kind of like general description. And there, there must be some variation because, because you know, the way people operate, uh, offering special kind of services to cater their patrons, um, they add, they add um, different and, and special, sometimes unique services. Um, I'm not going to get into the details of what kind of services they, they offer in order to make their uh, business more popular among, among the patrons. Um, room salons is popular and probably the most expensive. And we often use the terms like 2% or 10% in describing room salons um, in terms of uh, the woman's appearance and qualifications they have. Um, sophisticated conversation, intelligent um, dialogues, um, uh, very, very pleasant physical appearance. So 
um, when you when you get to get the services provided by this group of women, um, it's often called two percent. But when you go a little bit lower in terms of the qualifications of the servers, um, it's described as ten percent. And we also have karaoke bars, um, which we use. We 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 usually think that you know those places are for singing and and, and partying. But um, some karaoke bars have this term talanjujam, and that means uh, for your dancing and and singing parties, you you get to invite um, women, professional women, who's going to sing and dance with you, but. You also can negotiate um, sex trade uh, with the women at karaoke bars and massage parlors. We get to see them. We know they are there and they are quite popular. As I got to overhear the conversation um, between the four men um, yesterday, and various rooms, um, and rooms, they, it, the Korean word for room is bang. And because Korea is quite congested, especially the, the urban areas, you know, there are there are small spaces which offer um, 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 services in, in sexual sexual nature. And they are amma bang, um, massage, massage rooms, kiss bang, kiss rooms, um, jonhwa bang, phone um, rooms. Um, um, ear massage, ear waxing, ear wax removal service that take place theoretically in, in those rooms. And we have coffee shops. Um, they are often called ticket tabang. You order coffee over the phone and women deliver the beverages, but there you can negotiate um, sex trade um, with coffee shop ladies and barber shops, barber shops where um, pseudo sexual activities take place. Um, ladies who usually provide facial services for men, um, you know, the men can ask for more services in different nature um, so that he can release his sexual desires at those barber shops and brothels, brothels, red light, red light districts where um, straightforward um, sexual intercourse takes place. And um, how do they operate? Um, what is the mod modus operandi of, um, uh, of sex industry in South Korea? Um, the owners are either individuals or um, corporate. And when we say corporate type, um, sex business, it is usually um, run by organized crime ring. Um, so a uh, heavy dosage of criminality is involved um, in, in corporate type um, sex trade. And the owners, whether they are individuals or, or corporate type um, operations, they have nationwide network among themselves, um, of course illegal. And how they operate is that when a woman uh, runs away from an establishment, um, the owner, owner, the, the employer of the woman um, who escaped can send out the information about her to other stores um, all over the country and they communicate with each other. Most of the times um, uh, the women in, in sex trade do not have marketable skills. So even though they run away from one store, one establishment, they tend to try to find another employment somewhere else. So this kind of um, um, alternative um, methods of finding employment somewhere else cannot work because of the, the tight network shared between the owners, individuals, as well as um, uh, corporates. And in addition to the sex workers themselves and the owners who are often called as pimps, 
um, there are madams, madams usually for room salons, sponsors, solicitors, and, and um, for per particular locale like um, Brussels, the solicitors are usually called nakai imo, um, aunts, aunts who are out there fishing men and loan sharks. Um, women usually find employment in sex industry when they are in, in, in debt. So before they begin their employment, um, they try to get um, advance payment where loan sharks work with the owners slash employers. And there are other kinds of um, services that support um, the sex industry, like um, they are plastic surgery clinics, hotels, motels, hair salons, laundry services, food delivery services, um, pet shops, um, fortune tellers, okay? And in order to show you um, the problems involved with sex industry, which do not go away even after um, the 2004 um, Special Act on Prostitution, um, I just was able to collect uh, recent news um, in, in, in Korean media um, about, about sex industry. Um, what was about um, the arrest of the owner of a boy Professor bar? Kim. Ne? Hi. Professor Kim, excuse me. Yes. On your PowerPoint, mm -hmm. could you change it to the slideshow mode? Oh. Um, yeah, uh, one of the, the recent um, uh, news, newspaper articles was about a boy bar uh, called Boy Prince, um, which is located in Shin Okubo in Tokyo. And one thing, one particular thing about this particular uh, establishment was that um, they were hiring about 40 Korean young men on student visas and um, the owner was arrested on the charges of um, immigration law violation. And when you, when you get to think about this interesting gender reversal in, in sex industry, you know, it seems like young Korean men are in hot demand um, by Japanese women. And that I thought um, this was noteworthy. And, and another thing that caught my attention was that um, the prosecutors are seeking um, 35 years and 40 years in prison to two sister pimps in Wanju. And this happened about two weeks ago. And the, the contents of the, 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 the two sister pimps actions um, against of the prostitutes uh, were just um, very inhumane. And the re citizens' rallies in various parts of Korea continue um, calling for the revision of 2004 Special Act on Pro uh, Prostitution. And I'm going to um, uh, explain why um, the citizens and activists see the 2004 Special Act on Prostitution um, is not working as is expected, okay? And as I have described, you know, um, it's almost like open secret that you know, men can buy sex basically everywhere, everywhere in, in South Korean society. And, um, you know, uh, Ubiquity, it's, it's everywhere. People know it, but don't talk about it. And, and that, that ambience of suspicion and secrecy is still, um, still strong in the air, I think. And, oh, okay, here. And how ubiquitous 
is is this sex trade in South Korean society? This is um, you know, I I I, I took this uh, uh, aerial map of Gangnam uh, from from Kim and Ha, um, and the dots in different colors show different kinds of establishments that provide sexual services. Um, some in pink, some in orange, some in blue, and they are either room salons, uh, massage parlors, karaoke bars. And when you think about Gangnam, you know, um, Gangnam, Gangnam is a hot place for uh, its um, cons cons the concentration of wealth in the area as well as education. You know, a lot of Korean parents try to move to Gangnam to provide better educational opportunities for their children. And yet, you know, we get to see these um, um, establishment, establishments um, interwoven in, in other um, buildings and, and, and places. So, you know, they, they, are, they are very popular. And let me show you a little bit of, um, a little bit of statistics. Um, just to um, drive it home about its size and frequency and number of people who are involved in, in sex industry in South Korea. Um, 2017, um, the size of Korea's the sex industry was estimated to be about uh, 0.5, excuse me, 5.5 US dollars, billion US dollars. When you think about it, I mean, the, the size of the industry is humongous, uh, 5.5 billion US dollars. And 2017, um, for the girls, for the women who are working in sex industry, actually, who are also underaged, more than half of them experienced sexual violence uh, when they were younger. And um, 2010 cases of sex trafficking um, estimated by, by the ROK government, uh, 46, uh, 46, about 47 million cases. And um, as, again, as of uh, 2010, four out of 10 Korean, Korean males admitted of having purchased sex in their, in their lifetime, uh, which is not small, four out of 10. And the number of sex workers, um, the females, um, 142,248. And the government passed a law um, to curb prostitution in 2004. And the essence of the law was basically um, to empower um, the women in sex workers by providing them with um, vocational training and as well as nullifying the advance payment they receive when they first get a job in the industry. Okay. And who buys? Um, according to the ROK government statistics, the buyers are mostly. Um, highly educated white color males in their 20s and 30s. And how is it possible? Um, you know, when you think about the friendship culture where um, company workers go out and, and, and share meals and drinks together in order to, in order to um, create a stronger sense of camaraderie and, and, and in order to promote a, cl a closer cooperation and collaboration in the workplace. Um, the frequency of such occasions annually is about 11 times. And after, after such drinking and, and, and sharing food um, gatherings, um, about eight times, nine times, um, they go for a second round, which is often called like a hospitality um, round, um, okay? And, uh, most companies prefer room salons because it's their um, comfort zone. It's it's a safe place where they can they can they can play. They can play like men. It's a it's a it's a safe and protected and secretive place where they really don't have to think too much about the implications 
in terms of um, um, ethics and, and, and morality. Um, during the course of my research, I, 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 I ran into this editorial and um, with one of the major dailies in Korea. And this, this particular editorial was published in 2010. And basically what this, the writer of this editorial is saying, you know, it's saying is that, you know, you ladies, um, uh, middle-aged um, housewives, try to learn from the ladies at the room salons. They are like angels for us. Um, we can do what, please, what pleases us without thinking too much, without offending our partners and they listen to you. So, you know, um, if a wife wants to get respected and, treat, uh, and loved, uh, by her husband, she should learn how um, how a room sal salon lady is 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 behaving and treating their men. So, you know, I I I found this uh, particular editorial quite amusing because this was carried by one of the major dailies in Korea. Okay, um, from now on, we'll look at history, history of South Korea's sex, sex industry. And according to an article carried by Chicago Tribune in 1919, um, this is a direct quote. It says, one of the first things Japan did in Joseon was the creation of racialized entertainment district. Okay. Um, and this is, um, this is a photo photo uh, of all photo uh, 192 of Midori Machi in Busan, which, which is now one or two, uh, still in operation, still prospering. And as the relationship between Japan and Korea became closer because of the um, imposition of colonial rule, um, by Japan over the peninsula, you know, um, brothels, brothels were popping up um, all over Korea. Basic, um, and the, the major venues were basically port cities where um, the influence uh, coming from the island country of Japan was bigger. You know, it was easier for the port cities to, to, to get exposed to different kinds of activities coming from the island country. Um, some photos of Bunsan, um, Incheon port, like, of course, all, all of these are about um, brothels and entertainment um, establishments during the colonial era. And also Daegu, um, now it's called Chagal Madang, but it was um, Yae Kakicho, and also in Seoul, Xinjiang, in Xinjiang Dong, um, 19, um, Japanese established um, public brothels. Okay. And as time went by, you know, um, uh, brothels, which were basically introduced to Korean society by the Korean colonialists, began to Koreanize. So, um, When you look at the numbers of um, sex workers in terms of their nationalities, we began to see a larger number of Korean prostitutes working at uh, public brothels as time goes by. And also the system became more elaborate, uh, such as installation of um, sexually transmitted disease screening centers and, and the number of uh, prostitutes officially registered with the government began to increase. So uh, when you compare the numbers uh, between um, 1925 and 1942, initially there were a larger number of Korean prostitutes, but um, uh, Koreans outnumbered them um, 17 years later by more than two times, okay? Um, again, Koreanization of um, uh, brothels. Larger number of 
a, a Korean prostitute officially registered with the government and fewer number of uh, Japanese prostitutes um, by 1942. Okay. So the lady at the center of this, this photo is um, Japanese Mama-san and the servers of the entertainers are in, in Hanbok, uh, Chimajogori. So you get to see the power dynamic in terms of nationality. And um, the graphs also, also show, you know, um, the increasing number of um, Koreans, Koreans in, in sex industry from 1921 until 1942. Um, you get to see the, 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 the graphs um, in red, um, which indicates the number of um, Korean prostitutes in, in sex industry. And they began to increase dramatically from the mid 1930s. And we get to see different kinds of entertainers in, in sex industry and the names and their, their, their works um, reflect um, pre-existing Korean um, entertainment culture. Changi Yegi Chakpu, you know, Changi and Yegi. They were entertainers as well as, um, you know, they were available for um, sexual transaction. And Chakpu, Chakpu were basically straightforward um, prostitutes. Okay, so we get to see the different numbers, uh, the, 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 the fluctuation in numbers per, per different kind of um, um, jobs they were holding. And you know, I'm not going to uh, explain the details about um, control mechanisms of these women um, during the colonial, colonial era. How were they? meaning they, you know, Korean prostitutes and some Japanese prostitutes um, controlled by the authorities, basically um, they didn't have freedom and they couldn't exercise autonomy. Um, whenever they wanted to leave the premise, in other words, um, the area which was designated for um, prostitution, um, they needed to acquire um, per permission from most of the times police authority. And um, they were not allowed to leave the premise um, to take care of personal businesses like shopping or taking a walk. They didn't have that kind of freedom. Um, basically, you can see the system of, um, system of control quite similar to slavery system where people the individuals didn't have um, freedom over their physical movement, um, over their bodies, and they were under tight um, surveillance and control system, uh, mostly by the police force. And Korea got liberated in 1945, and, and Korea became a free country, and does it mean that you know, uh, the women in sex industry could get to enjoy bigger freedom and larger autonomy and better uh, upper mobility chances. Um, I'm afraid not. It didn't. It didn't happen like that. Um, even though the country was enjoying um, and celebrating the newly found um, freedom. Um, it was not translated into the improvement of um, the women's uh, well-being. Um, the U.S. government entered Korea and 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 it tried to abolish public brothels in 1948, but the Korean War breaks breaks out in 1950, and our government um, began um, installing. Comfort stations, which was very similar to Japanese military comfort, comfort women, comfort women um, stations, comfort stations, and and during the war, um, in particular the year of 1952, 
um, there were 78 officially cert certified brothels. And between 600 and 700 non-certified brothels were in operation, according to the report by Busan Ilbo. And Korean War, um, again, um, did not, did not, bring about um, different roles in women. Of course, women uh, as well as men were suffering during the war in different ways. You know, war is a, is a, is a, is a very tragic um, and violent, um, unnecessary event. And during the Korean War, um, you know, uh, Korean, Korean prostitutes were called as UN madams at that time because uh, UN forces intervened the Korean War and, and there was demand, demand for, for the women's uh, sexual work. And, and um, again, according to a newspaper article, of Busan Ilbo, um, the way they justified the prospering of um, prostitution, uh, prostitution for the foreign soldiers was that, you know, the prostitutes, Korean prostitutes were protecting many housewives who could suffer in an unexpected transition transition period in other words you know in order to protect the ordinary housewives uh prostitutes were filling in as as the alternative to to satisfy the sexual desires of um, foreign soldiers and um a cartoon coming from a, a woman's magazine in 1955 and um korean prostitutes during this period uh, were called UN madams. Um, excuse me. Oh, this uh, the, the, the narrative uh, in, in this slide is is quite identical with the previous one. Um, and um, the trade was becoming international um, because of uh, Korea's military and st strategic um, locations during the Cold War era. Um, they were called. They were called by different names: um, Western princess, entertainer, um, comfort women, special business workers, and we know of uh, the incidents of um, uh, Korean women in sex industry who married two American soldiers, and you know their 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 life experiences in, in the US, which was a, a stranger, stranger's land to them, you know, how their um, personal lives evolved and how they differed. Um, we got to hear some of them. Um, and again, I'm not going to read all the, all the uh, details about the laws on, uh, on the sex industry. Um, as Korean economy was picking up, um, uh, the government, um, strong-handed government also um, tried to control um, sex industry. And this time their preoccupation was about sanitation. They wanted to keep sex industry and, and, and the areas where those activities took place clean, uh, free of disease. So most of the the, the um, uh, legal actions um, taken by our South Korean government were about keeping keeping the industry free of disease uh, if possible okay and government um, under Park Jun -hee, um also out of its preoccupation with sanitation um, designated special areas so that they could contain they could contain um, the, the sexual transactions taking place and also um, control the area. So a uh, larger number of especially designated areas for sexual activities um, begin to pop up. And 
one of the former sex workers here, um, Kim Yeonja, this is not her real name. Um, and, and this is a quote, she said, um, you know, being confined to the specially designated area as sex worker, it was, it was hard on her. And she said, it was more than bad luck. I thought my pussy was mine, but now government says it's theirs. So the, the, uh, uh, the dictatorial government was controlling women's body where women could not exercise again, autonomy over their, their, their body as well as their activities, okay? And um, Korea, as as one of the the military base camp countries in Asia, along with Japan, um, um, sex workers catering catering to um, a foreign troops um, began to pop up. Uh, Dongducheon. Pyeongtaek, um, Busan, all these areas. And this is, oh, excuse me, um, this is a photo of, of Wan Um, You know, Busan is, is a port city and now uh, uh, USS Reagan is, um, is, is, is at the port, um, it, it embarked here and uh, Wan Dong uh, began to cater on foreign soldiers, which used to, which used to um, serve um, a, a Japanese during the colonial, colonial era. And this is the photo of the clinic, which basically um, screens um, STD um, from 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 the workers. You know, so this photo is 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 very very recent. And kissing tourism of 1970s, um, you know, uh, Korea became one of the most popular tourist destinations in Asia. And um, sex industry during that time period, which was often called kissing tourism, um, attracted uh, highly valued foreign cur currency, um, particularly Japanese yen. Um, so 30% in the 19th, uh, um, in the 1970s, um, Korea as a, as a country attracted more than 1 million overseas tourists and seven popular tourist destinations in Asia. Okay, so um, the women, the women um, in sex, uh, sex industry during that time period were regarded as and encouraged and praised as um, patriots who were making very precious foreign currency US dollars, um, Japanese yen for the sake of national economy. Okay. And um, a photo showing the scene of kissing party, you know, Korean women in, in, in traditional dress serving Japanese men. Um, it did not change um, during John Duan's reign, um, in particular, 1988 Seoul Olympic Games, um, in order to advertise um, the international sporting event, um, they used and, and exploited uh, young Korean women's highly sexualized um, image in order, to, uh, in order to draw the attention from the world. And some of the photos coming from Jeonju. Now we are looking at red light district in Jeonju. Um, um, I, can, I can explain more how it works. Um, the women in, 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 in white wedding gown um, put on display. And this room is called glass room where men can pick and choose um, who they like. And, and women soliciting men uh, on the street uh, saying things like, you know, you want a good time, you know, let's have some, some, let's have some fun kind of solicitation and the actual image of, of the room, which 
um, a sex worker women rent um, on a monthly basis and where uh, the transaction takes place. Um, towels, um, condoms, um, razors, and all those necessities are purchased by women, financed by women, and they are overcharged. And that's why these women very, very, I mean, except just a handful of cases, they are never free from the debt. Okay. Um, okay. Um, as I have described about, about what I saw um, uh, late evening yesterday, you know, uh, it, it looks like um, sex purchase can be just ordinary activities in South Korea, you know, you as you go out and 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 play bowling with your friends, you know, let's go to massage parlor and have some fun kind of mentality, which which doesn't seem to go away. But let me add here, um, in order to make make um, what I see fair, is that there are of course men, Korean men who refuse to be part of this, this sex industry and, and purchase of sex, you know, and, and they, 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 they have their own ways of engaging in um, parting culture without losing their face, such as like, um, you know, when they're, when they're co-workers uh, suggest, let's go for the second round. Um, some men make a deal with the women saying, you know, like, you know, I have girlfriend, I have wife, um, I don't like this kind of activities. So shall we just take about an hour, um, being quiet, not doing anything, but act as if we did it when we walk out of this door together and you get paid and I don't lose my face, you know? That kind of um, a tacit resistance um, some Korean men engage in. So I really cannot say, you know, like, oh, you know, sex is everywhere and Korea, basically every Korean man is doing that. I, you know, it's not fair. So I'm not going to make that kind of statement because there are variations. Um, 2004 was a very important year in, in sex industry and um, this bar in orange um, suggests shows the number of uh, prostitutes in thousand um, in 2004. But as you can see, the number increased substantially the following year. And uh, compared to the previous year, which is 2003, you know, the, uh, the number of prostitutes in, in sex industry has decreased substantially, uh, I must add and system of uh, financial exploitation. Almost always, um, the primary reason why women go into sex industry is because they need money. Whether they're in debt, uh, whether they ran away from home, whether they were escaping from um, uh, domestic violence, child abuse, whatever. They, their primary motivation is to, to, to make money. So, uh, when you look at the system, the system of uh, system of uh, uh, finance finances in the industry, you just get to realize that you know it is very very difficult for these women to be free from the debt and even to make money in the industry. They start with uh, advance payment because most of times they were they are already in debt before finding the job in sex industry, right? So they need advance payment and the pimps exploit the situation by paying her a lump sum in advance. And the pimps usually tell the women, you know, like if you work hard, um, you can pay off your debt easily and you'll make a lot of money, but it doesn't work like that. They have to pay for various expenses like renting a room, the necessities, basic necessities for their services like um, contraceptives. Um, they have to pay tips for the bouncer um, and the penalties 
the penalties are very, very hefty. For instance, um, during menstruation period, um, when they have to skip or work, um, the penalty, amount of penalty for absence is, is huge, like um, easily uh, $1,000 a day. So the system is, is very, very exploitative. Okay. And um, psychological control. Most of the times, um, you know, as I have briefly explained, um, the underage sex workers uh, in particular, um, more than half of them already experience sexual violence. And most of the times they are from broken families. Um, they have um, broken relationships with their parents. Um, you know, so they are after money, but at the same time, they want to belong and they need affection and they also need attention. So, you know, um, the pimps, the pimps, the people, the, 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 the employers in the industry usually use familial terms like, you know, oh, call me, call me mom, you know, call me dad, and also called a bouncer, mostly women aunt, you know? So, so the, there is a, there is a atmosphere of family in, in the system, which the women, um, the sex workers badly need in their lives. So there is, um, there, they, they use various tactics, um, grooming, um, gaslighting, uh, make it, very friendly, um, family-like words, mom, dad, and Onni, Onni, these women are often called Onni, and they are often threatened, like when you run away, you know, the police is not going to help you because we work with police. You have nowhere else to go. And we are like family, you know, so we will continue like this. And also when the women run away, um, they are often um, sued on fraud charges that advance payment they took off, they used up, but they didn't pay back. So these women are in debt, but they, they are evading their financial responsibility, so they commit fraud. So um, there are various mechanisms to control the women in the system. And this is basically about brothels. But when you look at the workings of room salons, you know, room salons, 2%, 10%, um, educated, um, sophisticated, good-looking women, when they first their, find their, their jobs, you know, um, again, very friendly, um, sophisticated madams who used to be um, sex workers themselves say things like, oh, you know, if you, if you, if you make your breast bigger, you know, you are going to, uh, you are going to have uh, more businesses because men like big-breasted men, kind of. Then, um, there is a system of collaboration, like, you know, uh, plastic surgery clinic, um, um, loan sharks who make, who make payment for the surgery, and madame who gets certain percentage from the plastic surgery clinic um, for making recommendations and the woman. So the system is, is rather elaborate, where women often find themselves trapped in. Okay. Um, again, I'm not going to uh, ex uh, explain in great details about 2004 Special Act on Prostitution. Let me briefly explain. That is, this law made um, punishment for the shop owners, Kim's, um, much more strict than before. So, when you engage in sex trade and, and exploit the women, the penalty that, that the owner has to pay became simply more severe. And the second element of um, this law regards nullification of advance payment. Women find jobs in sex industry to make money. And this um, advance, advance payment is their shackle. So they cannot be freed from, from all sorts of surveillance and control and abuse and exploitation. 
um, by various various people in the system. So the government decided to annul, annul the women's obligation to pay back uh, uh, advance payment. Okay. Um, so as you have seen uh, from for one of the 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 the, the graphs, um, this law was effective to a degree, to a degree, by looking at the number of women in sex industry before and after, before and after 2004. But there are problems uh, about this law. The first problem is that both the buyers and sellers are subject to punishment. When you look at the different structural locations of the buyers and sellers, and when both of them are subject to equal um, in terms of type and amount of punishment, it's going to work against the sellers because buyers with resources, money, um, networks, um, you know, um, they create the market for, for um, sexual services, but the sellers are at the disadvantageous position because they are the ones who need businesses to get by. So when you put these two different groups of people in one lot in applying the law, it's going to work against the sellers. Okay. And another um, point, another problem of this law is that victims, in other words, sellers, women in sex industry have to prove that they are victimized. They need to produce and submit material evidence to convince the police and prosecutors that they are actually the victims of uh, human trafficking, for instance, which is really hard because when they start out, you know, um, they write up all sorts of contracts. And the contracts sometimes say, you know, like, oh, I'm doing this out of my own will, you know, um, 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 there was no pressure. I just take this as my job and, and there was no coercion. So in order to prove your victimhood, in order, you need to produce material evidence, which is really difficult, you know, when you consider, consider the, the circumstances. Okay, um, I like to conclude um, by suggesting alternative models um, to curb um, sex industry, that is Nord Nordic model, um, some of the countries in, 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 in Northern European region, Norway, Denmark, Sweden, Iceland, and Finland, they have, they, they enacted a law in part, with particular emphasis on the case of Sweden in 1999, um, which only penalized the buyers of sex, not the sellers, okay? So unlike 2004 Korean law, Nordic model punishes the buyers in order to eradicate the demand for um, sexual services in the system, okay? So women are not punishable even though they are prostitutes, officially, objectively, okay? And, uh, excuse me, um, what kind of results in the case of Sweden um, was able to accomplish from this 1999 law that that is, um, the number of sex sellers decreased by 75%, by 75%. So number of prostitutes in Sweden, is, in Swedish sex industry decreased by 75% during 10 year period from 1999 when the law was enacted until 2008. And also percentage of sexual, sexual purchases decreased from uh, 13.6 to 7.8, 7 okay? Um, so when you compare 
the workings of supply and demand um, on the supply side, um, you know, uh, the achievement was phenomenal, but it was less so on the on the in the case of the demand side. You know, the, the change was not drastic, but still meaningful. Okay. That was that was the conclusion of my talk by suggesting alternative model of um, of curbing um, the the demand for um, sexual services by looking at the Nordic model. Okay, so this was this was my PPT presentation and. You know, I, I know that I talked a lot about different things, like we looked at the history of, of, of sex injuries in South Korea, and, and we looked at the laws, we looked at its systems, organizations, and, and what the people do in, in sex in industry do, and its hierarchy, and, and among other things. Um, and I like to ask for your questions so that I can be more helpful um for your concerns okay okay thank you that was boy a lot of stuff yeah there was a lot of stuff and um yeah um I, no. I, i'm not on the camera i'm just behind the camera can you see people in our audience here yes yes i can okay i, I don't know whether i've got it adjusted but um <clears throat> i'm gonna just open the floor questions um, uh, uh, Jennifer, yeah, go ahead. Hi, you talked quite a bit about this, uh, the uh, legal changes in 2004. Um, I was wondering if you could talk really briefly about any civic groups or civic movements that are involved in um, sort of anti sex work or involved in uh, assisting sex work. Oh, you mean um, uh, uh, NGOs? NGOs, but also I'm sure there are other kinds of groups. Um, I, I'm thinking of in places like the US, there's a, a very wide range of different civic and religious mm -hmm. groups involved. So I want mm -hmm. to sort of talk about on the non governmental side what kind of groups we see and what they're doing. You know, um, actually, um, there are there are a large number of NGOs and also MPOs involved in um, in 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 empowering women in the sex industry or to improve the situation within the industry. So I really cannot tell you the exact number of NGOs or MPOs, but let me contextualize your question a bit. Feminist movement in South Korea has a lot to do with. To 2004 law. And the context of feminist movements in, in, in the case of South Korea was rooted in um, comfort women issues, Japanese military comfort women issues. Before comfort women issue became a national social problem uh, from the 1990s, Feminist movement in South Korea was not that widely known or active. And that means there were fewer number of NGOs and MPOs devote, uh, devoted to the cause of um, gender equality. But with the rise of um, Japanese military comfort women issue as an as a, as a, as a important national, political, um, social agenda, Feminism began to prosper accordingly. And in that context, people began to pay attention to domestic sex industry. And they realized that, you know, um, it has long history. I mean, when you, when you think about sex industry in general, it has long history. It has very long history um, in, 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 in different continents and cultural contexts as well. But, um, the introduction of public brothels, um, UN madams during the Korean War and Kisengangwang and uh, Olympics and uh, its implications for uh, sex tourism, 
all these bring all these began to make sense and all the uh, pieces of puzzle began to fall into places. So um, in order to make um, 2004 uh, legislation possible, uh, women's uh, organizations in various forms of, uh, contributed and, 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 and they contributed, but we need to contextualize their act activi act activism within a South Korean feminist movement, which became very active uh, because of uh, Japanese military comfort zone issues from the late 1990s. Does it make sense? Yes, thank you. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah, thanks very much uh, for your, uh, your lecture, Professor. Uh, can I ask you a bit about the economics of what you call the corporate side of this trade? Um, I've interviewed one madam, and I've, I've actually been to one very, very high end. Um, uh, establishment, which is in the basement of a major hotel in Canada. And it was very clear and obvious to me that the prices being charged were for the food and beverage, I'm not talking about sex, were literally markups of thousands of percent. And uh, the guy I was invited by, a businessman, he paid it on, I guess, a corporate credit card. Uh, and I could not understand how that expense could ever be justified. Um, so <laughs> I wonder, is there a rebate system for the companies? Are these partly owned by corporations? Um, is this a laundering operation of some sort? Because it just doesn't seem to make sense. These expenses couldn't be justified by any accounting department in any company unless there's something going on. You know, um, businesses, businesses are very well aware of the importance of providing hospitality to their potential clients, right? And fancy dinners and, and, and gifts, all these are actually on the continuum of providing physical sexual services in order to cater their businesses. So this is, when you think about it, the system is actually quite rational, but how to logistically implement such expenditure? I you know um, when they get um, receipts for, for the highly priced um, services, as you have mentioned, you know, uh, a bottle of whiskey can cost like 2 million, 3 million won, which is 2,000, 3,000 US dollars. Um, the issuer of receipt, it doesn't list the name of the business as XXX Room Salon. It is issued by another legitimate business in order to justify the transaction. So when a third party looks at the receipt and examines it, it is really hard to tell who actually issued the receipt. Can you follow? follow up that question. In terms of the profits being made, who's making this profit? Who, who's, who, make, who's making the profit? Yeah, because these oh. people are still be living in hotels in, in the Bahamas. I mean, profits are extraordinary, thousands of percent. Plus oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And that's one of the reasons why organized crime um, groups are involved, very closely involved in, in sex trade. Um, and of course the profits are divided by the stakeholders, you know, um, it can be an individual, it can be a company or corporate, and they, they divide the profits uh, between the owner, the employers, employers meaning um, the servers, um, uh, the investors, and all including the, the, the women themselves. So, you know, it's a, it's a lucrative business. You had a question. Yeah. I, I, I wonder what is the demographic of the sex workers in Korea? So we Dem demographic, like, um, are they locals? Are they uh, from other parts of the world? Uh, the oh. Reason, yeah, the reason I ask is that I want to know the reason behind why they get into the industry. 
oh, you know, I, 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 I didn't include that particular aspect of sex industry in Korea. Actually, um, it is quite tr um, transnational. Um, Korean sex industry is importing foreign women, primarily from Vietnam, the Philippines, and sometimes Russia. So um, it's not ethnically homogeneous anymore. It is, it is rather uh, internationalized. That's domestic market. And on the other side of the coin, um, Korea also exports uh, prostitutes to overseas market. For instance, um, in Canada, um, a few years ago, uh, human trafficking ring was busted because they worked with um, uh, local business in order to bring Korean women on work visa. But actually, they were working in, 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 in brothels, uh, providing different you know, uh, services to, to local Australian men. And very similar um, a business model has been exported to, for instance, the US, where, where a large number of Korean Americans, men, mostly men, get to enjoy the kind of services they used to enjoy back home. So, you know, uh, the, uh, the relationship uh, has become a lot more in internationalized and it has become a lot more active. And also it means um, uh, um, Korean sex industry has become an international issue because of it is criminality. As, as I was beginning um, to give a talk about, you know, about this topic, you know, we got to see um, boy prints uh, with, you know, basically catering to uh, Japanese women who have desires for young Korean men. So, you know, this, this system is, is a lot more international than, than, than we can imagine. Did I answer your question? Okay. Okay. Thanks very much for your uh, presentation. I have a question more about the 2004 law and whether it changed the legal status of red light districts because until a few years ago, you still had Chongyang 588. Mm -hmm. Their uh, station in Seoul, you still do have the red light district. So, what effect did the law have on those? legal status? Um, actually, um, strictly speaking, they are illegal. They are illegal. Um, Chongyang Ni um, was prospering, as you have said, until recently. But in the case of Busan, um, we have Wanoldong. Uh, Wanoldong, uh, the literary translation of that area is full moon, um, full, full uh, one, one is full moon, uh, dong, it, 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 where, you know, uh, straightforward sexual transaction takes place. That's the area and we call it one dong. And the, the name of one dong actually officially does not even exist, you know, but it, it's still there. It has very long history. Um, it, it started around nine, uh, 1904 and it continues. And everybody knows that What's happening in the area is illegal, but it continues. Um, why? Because partly the area has very close uh, association with um, uh, organized crime. Chilsongpa, <laughs> Chilsongpa, uh, Seven Star, Seven Seven Star Group very notorious uh, organized crime. So the area is protected by organized crime ring, which has very strong and powerful presence in the city. And even the police force cannot enter the area and, and shut down the businesses. Because once that happens, you know, it's going to get violent and police doesn't want to go there. And another thing is people are kind of used to it 
because of its long history, even though the area does not officially exist, people know it's there. So customers still go there, generating, generating demands. So, you know, even though it's illegal, when something has been there long enough, it's really hard to get rid of. And another thing is, you know, as I have uh, briefly explained, um, it has a lot to do with uh, the details of the law, which uh, punishes both uh, uh, the seller and, and buyer. And, you know, it has become risky on both parties. So both of them, you know, while fully knowing the fact that what they're doing is illegal and criminal, um, they try to, in a way, collude with each other um, in secretive fashion, making it hard for their business transaction go away easily. Does it make sense? Yeah, no, that's helpful. It, uh, it's interesting because I used to live in Taejeon near uh, Yusan Hochan, which uh, <clears throat> is very similar to some of the other areas we talked about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, yes, back in the corner, sir. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, you made very open and clear explanation. I appreciate it for that. Uh, my argument is the uh, first question is that uh, the very domestic and transnational. Uh, Third thing is injustice to say the judge, the court, never you know, make justice and say they are they are doing a blind eye when the case they see, but they are behaving like blind eye. And police are also say they are not really catching the main one. You know, to punish the main one, they are behaving like blind guys. Also, police are also not acting. They are behaving like blind guys. Only we can see on the news newspaper only minor thing. Maybe England or somebody uh, very very great. England or for whole country. If there is a case, they highlight. But there are many main things they never highlight. And they were never justified, and they were done blind. So I subscribe to your justice to say how it can be uh, improved, and police to say, and also newspaper. They never point out the main one. And as you said, most kids are underage, they become. Uh, because of family problems, I think there's also nobody quite out. There are domestic violence, you know, family sex abuse, their own family. Nobody quite out. I think there are, you know, <coughs> in Korea, the system, a collective uh, mistake, collective leadership. Mm -hmm. okay. So I don't know. My question is: Is the Korean population has the will to change this kind of system structure, or they just doing for uh, media highlight or something? So I'm not sure. So how is possible in Korea? Is this really the case? You know. Um... I, I sadly have to agree with your critical observations about the workings, especially um, legal enforcement um, system, workings of the legal enforcement system in South Korea. Um, I have read and heard about many cases where um, women were actually accused of being um, morally corrupt, um, bankrupt, because they are in sex industry, while their customers paying their customers 
who created the demand in the market first could cut away with um, law by hiring lawyers, um, by utilizing their um, uh, personal networks in, in the legal system. So it is, it is unfortunate. You know, I would have to agree with you, uh, with your um, critical, critical, saddening, um, poignant uh, observation. But at the same time, um, important progresses, important progress has been made, has been made. Um, the change of the, ch the changes are not taking place as quickly as we would like them to, but positive changes ha have been taking place because of the rising awareness of human rights, you know, the, the, the evils of human trafficking, um, the violence and abuse and exploitation take place within sex, uh, within sex industry and um, basically, um, the abuse of women, abuse of women financially, uh, physically, emotionally, within the industry and all that. So rising awareness that we, we, we should uh, not forget about, even though um, it's not as widespread as, as we'd like it to be. And also, um, women themselves, who used to be like, um, sex workers, they is, sometimes, you know, they manage to escape and sometimes they bring charges against uh, the abusers, uh, the pimps who, who, who exploited them. In the case of Wonju, you know, like one of the, the newspaper um, articles about sex industry that I introduced in the beginning of my talk, you know, um, those two evil um, women sisters, pimps, who did horrendous things to to the women, the charges were brought against them by the victims themselves. So you know we should we should keep various mechanisms in mind in order to prove prove the situation. Um, rising awareness among the general populace and empowerment of women by making them skillful, who can sell their skills and talents in legitimate. Um, industry in in the economy in general. After spending a few years in sex industry, most of them become so helpless, and they become um, they become um, dependent on the the very people who exploit them. At the same time, most of them are on antidepressants because the work is just so hard. The mm. work is very very hard. But you know. Um, the social welfare system and the support network should empower them by providing them very practical and tangible um, training so that they can get away from, from the particular industry and become um, contributing members of, of labor force. And it takes a lot of, it takes a lot of efforts and, and investment in terms of resources and, 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 and institutionalization of such training program. And also um, uh, legal changes. As I have said, 2004, uh, a special act on prostitution was, was a fantastic breakthrough, but it was not enough. So we need to be more progressive in learning from other successful cases coming from Sweden, Finland, Iceland, um, recently Israel, you know, they are punishing, they are punishing the, the buyers by, erad by trying to eradicate the demands. So the market in, in and of itself can disappear, you know? <clears throat> so um, various efforts that we need to make and they need to be synchronized in order to improve the situation. Did I answer your question? Well, thank you very much. Um... We could go on for some time. We're not going to get everybody's questions answered tonight, uh, but our time is up. And uh, Professor Kim, thank you very much for joining us. We appreciate your uh, lecture.